My name is Dirk England. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. My general area is in making devices and systems for quantum information processing. There's a lot of talk about the demise, the grinding to a halt of Moore's Law. As the feature sizes of semiconductor processors are reaching the scale of, a, of atomic systems. And as we reach that scale, we have to start to deal with the very strange behavior of light, uh, of light and matter at the atomic level. And that is no longer governed by sort of what we're used to, sort of more classical physics behavior, but it starts exhibiting a lot of very strange behavior that is governed by the rules of quantum mechanics. What my group tries to do is use semiconductor technologies primarily, wherever possible. And the so the motivation is simply that, you know, with semiconductor technology we can leverage a lot of really good processing techniques that have been developed for today's, you know, computers and internet and leverage that to um, build these very integrated and compact and possibly scalable information processing devices. Quantum simulation, quantum computing, precision measurement, and quantum communications that I think incorporate really the majority of the field of quantum information processing that my group is part of. Okay, so now there's a lot of different architectures that people are investigating towards reaching these goals. They're still very difficult. We have to, you know, we're still at the beginning of learning how to make components for these different uh, technologies, the different quantum technologies. So basically, there's two main ingredients. We want to store information in some stationary way, right? Like kind of like a magnetic memory would be in a, or a capacitor that you have in a, in a classical computer. And we want to have some way of moving information around. For us, the stationary memory is the orientation of an electron spin or nuclear spin. So electrons and nuclei, they have associated with them a magnetic moment, uh, kind of like a little dipole. And depending on if that dipole is pointed that way or that way, we can encode a one or a zero. And then, whereas in a classical computer, typically your wires are electrical wires that carry currents, we replace these with optical wires, waveguides, that carry photons. And then we have these two ingredients these stationary memories connected via photons. And most of our technologies are basically trying to combine these two ingredients into small uh, networks of quantum memories. One you know, key uh, goal for us is to build um, essentially a small quantum computer that consists of, let's say, a handful or a dozen or so quantum memories, uh, quantum bits that uh, would act as a repeater. Um, in, 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 in normal, uh, in, in typical quantum key distribution, the range of a cryptographic link is limited by how far a photon can fly. Maybe it's 100 kilometers or so, but then that photon is most likely absorbed. A photon in fiber after 100 kilometers has like a 99% probability of having been absorbed along the way, or scattered, something, some, some other way of losing it. Um, and typically what you would do, you know, classically, you'd put a repeater there. You'd put an erbium dope fiber amplifier, boost the signal, and send it on. But the no cloning theorem prohibits that. We're not allowed to do that in quantum mechanics. So we have to use a different, more clever way, a uh, different way, let's say, to replace that repeater. And one way to do that is to place at that 100 kilometer distance another quantum memory, and then do something that's called an entanglement, where basically put quantum memory at the sender and the transmitter into a joint non-local state and repeat that from the second station to the third station and so forth. And in this way, entangle further and further away quantum memories. Once people have a quantum memory that's entangled between, let's say, you know, here Baltimore and let's say Los Angeles, they can run protocols that are very similar to typical cryptography to then establish, for instance, a secure key for cryptography or to do other things that are possible on a quantum network. So, so that's sort of the overall view. What we're interested in is building that little repeater node. Uh, and that repeater node you know, uh, needs to have a few quantum memories, like I said, about a handful to a dozen of quantum memories um, that are reasonably well coupled to an optical fiber. Okay? And, um, and what we, you know, the, the hope is that we can integrate this thing into a small enough device and make it so that ultimately could be produced efficiently and scalably 
that it could, could become a component of what some people envision to be a quantum internet, sort of a, a quantum version of today's internet uh, that would have you know, a number of capabilities that our internet doesn't have, like secure communications, ways of distributing very precision, precise clock signals and so forth. You will start seeing small networks of entangled uh, physical systems um, at some distance uh, in laboratory settings. And there are now some very substantial efforts to actually bring that out of the laboratory and into small, let's say, metropolitan-sized area networks. Once you have these metro networks, you can then start thinking about making trunk lines that connect them. Okay, so you have like a star network in, in one metropolitan area connected via a trunk line to another one. A lot of the components and the protocols that have been developed for classical networks can carry over into quantum networks. For instance, if there hadn't been a lot of effort and ingenuity into developing low-loss optical fiber, we couldn't dream about what would be possible with the quantum network. A lot of the, the telecommunications equipment uh, we try whenever possible to uh, leverage and to piggyback on. But there are some key components, and that's really what we're trying to focus on, that have to be built essentially from scratch. There are many, many different architectures that are being explored for building scalable, fault-tolerant quantum computers, general-purpose quantum computers. One large class of these algorithms looks essentially like a small quantum network. It consists of some number of quantum registers that have a reasonably small number of qubits inside them. Let's say, let's think about maybe 10 qubits inside each one, maybe 20. It's small enough so that you can uh, interact with individual qubits or pairs of qubits efficiently without disturbing the whole of them. So they're packed into small packets, and then they're linked optically together. If you can build one of those unit cells that contains, let's say, 10, 20 qubits, you can scale up the power of, the, of this computer by just linking these together. So if we could find a way to mass manufacture these quantum nodes, these quantum memory nodes, we can string them together with light to make a distributed quantum computer. Our first computer will look maybe like one of those early computers with many different vacuum tubes strung together with some thick metal wires. But that's how it starts, right? And then, uh, in principle, every time in a quantum computer that you add a quantum memory, it exponentially increases. Every time you add a bit, you can, in principle, double the uh, computational power of it. You will not run your spreadsheet, maybe an internet search, but not your spreadsheet on a quantum computer. Um, so there will always be a place for classical computers, and I suppose they will always be restricted by Moore's law, <laughs> or by the, by the end of, of Moore's law. But I think there's a separate curve taking off, and that's a curve for quantum information processors.